is the fourth installment of a four-part series entitled Demystifying Probate and Estate Planning. We are here at the Noah Webster Library and we've had uh, four good crowds each time we've been here and this is uh, no different tonight. Uh, as you may know, uh, all of these sessions um, are, have been uh, well attended. I'm Owen Egan. I'm the judge of probate in West Hartford. Uh, this session is entitled Conservatorships and Title 19 or Medicaid. By the time you leave here today, I it is my hope that you will have a basic understanding about conservatorships and Title 19 or Medicaid. Before we start, I want to thank the West Hartford Libraries for co-sponsoring this event with me. Um, although um, you, just, you just heard from Maura Boudreau, uh, she's helped organize this event. I also want to thank Maura's uh, assistant or the, her co-worker, Rebecca Nugent, who is helping us here this evening. In fact, she's running the additional copies that will be passed out a little bit later. So just a round of applause for them and the West Hartford Library. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, I, I would also like to thank uh, Jennifer Evans from Channel 5 and her team, Micah, who is here. He's been here at every session. Uh, he had an assistant, Lex, who, who couldn't make it tonight, but Heidi is uh, filling in for him. I want to thank them for, be for being here and filming this. Um, this will be aired on Channel 5 WHC-TV, uh, and, and they've been wonderful, and uh, they deserve a round of applause as well. So thank you, guys. <laughs> Uh, Rich Marone uh, is, is an attorney who was on the panel last session. Uh, Rich was the former chairperson of the Estates and Probate section of the Connecticut Bar, and he helped uh, me bring together this wonderful panel of attorneys, including the two we have here tonight. Uh, they have all been excellent, excellent at each session, and they've done a great job, and each session has been fabulous. And you're in for a great program tonight. Um, this, this evening you will hear from two attorneys who are experts in their field. Uh, first is Kathleen Berry. Attorney Berry is a graduate of George Washington University uh, Law School in Washington, D.C. She has 30 years of experience in probate, estate planning, and elder law. Attorney Berry also handles family matters, real estate, and real estate. She is the founding partner in the firm Berry Law Group, LLC, located on LaSalle Road here in West Hartford. She is an accomplished writer and an, and an excellent advocate. She had previously served as a judicial law clerk in the Connecticut Superior Court. Uh, next, you have uh, Jay, Jay Kearns, John Kearns, who is also known as Jay Kearns. Jay is a, a graduate of Syracuse School of Law as well as Fordham University. Jay has over 35 years of experience uh, in the area of probate and estate planning and elder law and trusts. He is a principal in the law firm of Kearns and Kearns uh, which is located on New Britain Avenue in West Hartford. Attorney Kearns was the first Connecticut attorney to be board certified at, in, as an elder law specialist by the National Elder Law Foundation. Attorney Kearns has received many awards and honors in the area of elder law, including being inducted as a fellow of the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys. Both Attorney Kearns and Attorney Berry are experts in their field. Uh, they're respected by judges in, in uh, the state of Connecticut as well as their staff in the various uh, Connecticut courts that they serve. Uh, by volunteering their time tonight, like the other panelists who have appeared before uh, on, at the previous sessions, uh, they are doing a wonderful community service for the town of West Hartford. By my calculation, after all four sessions are complete, and this is the fourth session, uh, they, these attorneys who have volunteered their time will have given about $100,000 worth of legal service uh, to the town. So it's a, it's a wonderful service that they're providing uh, to us. Um, yeah, thank you. And thank the others who appeared before. Um, before, before we begin uh, tonight, for the benefit of those who were not here at the, at the other session, I'd like to give you some background about probate, the probate court and probate law in our state. The probate court system uh, in America has existed since colonial times and is about 300 years old. Originally, there were four probate courts in the state of Connecticut, one in Hartford, one in New Haven, one in New London, and one in Fairfield. Uh, the citizens of, from the town of West Hartford originally went to the probate court in Hartford, and eventually in 1982, West Hartford broke away from Hartford, and they established the West Hartford probate court here. Uh, the first probate judge was John Berman, and he he handled uh, the cases then. 
Back in colonial times, the probate court only handled a few matters. They handled estates and they handled guardianships. Um, uh, you, you may be familiar with, with, uh, with the estate process, but probate court now handles many, many more matters and they're, they're a uh, creature of um, statute and the probate courts do what, what, uh, what, what the uh, legislature allows them to do. Um, for instance, probate courts handle adoptions, they handle conservatorships like we're here to discuss tonight, uh, they handle guardianships of persons with mental disabilities, they handle name changes, termination of parental rights that you may not have known about, commitments for people with psychiatric disabilities, um, and, and commitments of those who need treatment for drug and alcohol abuse. The probate court handles all of those and the list goes on. Um, if you have not been to the probate court in West Hartford, please do so. Please come in. All, all are welcome. Uh, our probate court is inviting. The, the people there are a, a very sensitive, warm, and compassionate group. Uh, they're there to help, uh, help you understand the process. There's guides there that are available for, for your needs and uh, people, people are all welcome. So please, uh, please come, come by. Um, when you walk into the doors of the clerk's office, they are, are uh, very compassionate. They know that people are generally carrying a heavy burden, the loss of a loved one, for instance, or they may have to appoint a conservator um, and, and they're, they're very upset that their mother, father, or loved one needs a, needs a conservator. So their understanding of that and they'll help guide you. They can't give you legal advice, but they can give you uh, help in proce with procedure and they can guide you uh, on filling out forms and so forth. So please, please stop by if you, you, haven't, you haven't been there. For those of you who don't know, probate court is located in the town hall. It's directly across from the uh, council chambers on the third floor of the town hall building. So please stop by and you're welcome. It's open Monday through Friday from 8.30 till 4.30. Um, if you need additional information, you can also visit uh, uh, the website for the probate court administrator. It's www.ctprobate.gov and you can find additional guides and materials there if our court doesn't happen to have them uh, for, your, for your needs to suit your needs. Um, again, we're here to talk about conservatorships and Title 19 or Medicaid. Both are very important topics. Um, briefly, a conservator is a person appointed by the probate court to oversee the financial and personal affairs of an adult person, an adult person who is determined by the court to be incapable of manager, managing his or her affairs or unable to care for himself or herself. In some cases, a conservator can be appointed on a voluntary basis. Uh, in that case, uh, the person is a capable person who requests assistance in those areas. Uh, uh, on the subject of conservatorships in West Hartford, as I said, our court is a compassionate court. I can assure you that our goal is to respect the dignity of each person who is the subject of a petition for a conservatorship. And that really is the goal of the law, is to maintain the dignity of the person whose rights are being taken away from them in an involuntary setting. So you, you, you limit the amount of, of power that you give a conservator and you're very, very uh, careful not to take away a person's rights if they still have an ability to do certain things for themselves uh, because you, you want them to be able to do that and conservators are, are and should be sensitive to that. Um, Moving on, Title 19 or Medicaid, uh, to Title 19 or Medicaid, the, these terms refer to a health insurance program of the federal government. The program pays medical bills for people and for families who have low incomes and who lack resources. Here in Connecticut, Medicaid is run by the State Department of Social Services or, or DSS. In total, Medicaid provides health coverage to nearly 60 million Americans and it is governed by rules and regulations that continue to evolve. Medicaid, Medicaid law is a very complicated area and, and as, the case, uh, as, as is the case in many legal matters, the average person generally requires advice from an expert to navigate the, its intricacies. That's why we have attorney currents here to help us with that. Um, now we will hear from the experts. I will ask you to please hold your questions until after everyone has had uh, an opportunity to speak and then we will take questions from the audience at the end and everyone will have an opportunity to, to ask the panel questions. 
Um, so we're going to begin with Attorney Barry. Uh, Kathleen, would you please come forward? Sure. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. So I'm here to talk about conservatorships. Um, I was thinking that um, we really ought to start at the beginning, and that is it all starts when you turn 18 years old and you're deemed to be a capable adult, ready to make all the decisions you need for your adult life. So even though you're still in high school, the process begins. And we all make decisions throughout our lives, and they really cover two different categories. One set of decisions really has to do with our financial affairs, what we do with our income, how much we save, how much we spend. Do we buy a house? Do we go to the casinos? Uh, do we set up retirement accounts? Do we have joint accounts with our spouses? We have lots of decisions to make. Then we also make decisions regarding our personal affairs. This has to do with what kind of lifestyle we want to live. Do we get married? To whom do we marry? Uh, do we eat healthy? Do we exercise? Do we take a lot of risks? Do we get medical treatment for things? Whatever suits us, we have the right to decide. And so over the course of our lives, we usually just focus on um, the decisions that we're making day to day. Then often we have a life-changing event. A, a parent or another loved one dies, or the parents of young children are getting on a plane for the first time since the kids were born, and they start to think about their own mortality. And so in that instance, people usually think about preparing a will. And the will will take care of their affairs if they should pass on, or when they pass on. So sometimes when they're thinking about the will, they also think about the end of life decisions. So would I want a feeding tube? Would I want artificial uh, resuscitation? And so when they're filling out a will, they often will fill out a living will as well. And once again, that really takes care of them towards the very end of their lives. But we also have to think about and plan for um, the time that may come when we're very much alive, but we're no longer able to manage our lives. We're no longer capable of making those financial or those personal decisions for ourselves. And we have to plan for this because, as we all know, some folks have strokes, some people suffer from dementia, some people end up in an accident, and they're no longer able to make those really important decisions. And so while we're still capable, we have to create these legal documents that express our wishes. So the power of attorney is one tool that we have, and I don't know if you've heard about the power of attorney in the past few sessions, but it's gone, undergone a lot of changes, and it's a very important document. But the most important piece of that is that while you are still of sound mind, you're selecting the person to whom you're going to trust to make decisions for you. And there are a lot of decisions to be made, and the, the, the power of attorney form has a lot of powers. It has hot powers. It has a lot of areas where you can give control to this person, but you get to select a person that you trust. In the same way, we, there is a health care representative form. And in terms of that, you can't be as specific because you're never sure what medical decisions will need to be made. But you get to choose someone that you trust and someone that knows you, knows the lifestyle that you've chosen for yourself, and hopefully will honor you as they help your providers uh, make decisions for you when you can't. So this also in these documents an opportunity to select a conservator. Now normally you prepare these documents because you want to avoid being conserved. But just to hedge all your bets, there's usually an opportunity to say, if I happen to be conserved, I'm selecting uh, this person to be my uh, conservative person if need be, and this person to be my conservator of estate. And often, the person who you select to be the conservator of estate would be the same person who is your power of attorney. And the person you select to be the conservative person is more likely than not to be the person that you would select to be your health care representative. But if you don't have these documents and you become incapable of making these decisions for yourself, 
you can end up as what we call the respondent in a conservatorship proceeding. So if we turn to um, the family that we that you have been discussing over the past few sessions, we have Alan and Susan. So Alan is 78, Susan is 75. So let's say that Al, uh, Susan has a stroke. And Susan does not have a power of attorney, nor does she have a health care representative. She never felt like she had that much, that many assets that she would need a power of attorney. And she certainly thought that Alan, whom she loved and knew lo who loved her and three children, that they would be able to take care of her. So Susan's in the hospital, and she's probably going to be going to rehab. And Alan decides that he's going to sell Susan's car. Well, it turns out that Alan can't sell Susan's car because he's not on the title. He doesn't have um, the authority to sell Susan's car. So it could be that fact or any of a myriad of facts that come up where Alan finds that even though he's the husband of Susan, he cannot speak for Susan. So Alan has to file a petition with the probate court for the involuntary conservatorship of Susan. He fills out the form, uh, checks a lot of boxes. There's an area on the form for him to give a summary of the facts. He explains the situation, explains the Susan that he knew and how Susan is now and he pays the $225 fee. The probate court accepts the paperwork, and then one of the first things that the, that the court does is appoint an attorney for Susan, because Alan is asking the probate court to take away Susan's rights to make decisions for herself, this right that she's had since she was 18 years old. Um, the probate court Um, schedules a hearing within 30 days. If Susan can't come to the court, the judge goes to Susan. Uh, the judge will go to a hospital, a nursing home conference room, uh, he'll go to Susan's living room. But the court goes to Susan because she has the right to be at this hearing. A significant piece of evidence that the court will look at is the physician's evaluation. Alan, who's the petitioner, must get a medical doctor to submit a report. And that doctor has to give a diagnosis of Susan's medical condition, and he has to explain how that condition is leaving Susan incapable of making both her financial and her personal decisions. Um, at that hearing, Susan's attorney will be there uh, with Susan, um, protecting her client's rights in any way that's necessary. Uh, more likely than not, Jennifer and David, the children will attend, family members will testify about the situation. So <clears throat> let's assume uh, you might, the judge will look at the physical evidence, there might be nurses, social workers there. So let's assume that Judge Egan uh, grants the petition and um, makes the decision that Susan needs to have a conservator. Now he has to decide who will serve as a conservative person, who will serve as a conservator of a state. Well, Alan has proposed himself to be conservator of both person and estate for his wife. At the hearing, Jennifer, the daughter, uh, testifies that she thinks dad's doing a great job, but he's 78. This is overwhelming for him, and she's involved with all the doctors, and so she thinks she ought to be the conservative person. The other son, David announces he's just moved back to town. He's great with finances. He's been helping the dad pay all the bills, and he ought to be conservator of estate. Well, Alan pushes back on both of his children and says, this is my wife. I'm quite aware of what's going on. I'm working with the doctors. I appreciate their, their assistance, but uh, I'm the man for the job. So more likely than not, Judge Egan, if I would say, would appoint Alan as the conservator of both person and estate, and he might appoint Jennifer as the successor conservator of person, and David as the successor conservator of estate. So if anything should happen to Alan in the future, um, Susan's interests are protected, the family doesn't have to come back to court. So now, Alan 
as managing Susan's affairs, but not as her husband, as really under the authority of the probate court. He'll probably have to post a probate bond, and he needs to marshal all her assets, which means he has to take control of um, her accounts. He needs to file a notice on the land record um, in West Hartford where they own the real property together. Uh, within 60 days, he'll have to file an inventory, which means he has to uh, give notice to the court and all the interested parties uh, what assets <laughs> Susan has and what assets he's now in charge of. So that would include her half of the house they own, um, her life insurance policy, the car that she owns, and any assets that are on the list that we have filled out for you there. Now, Alan doesn't get carte blanche from the court. If Alan wants to sell the house, he has to come in and get permission. If he wants to sell her car, he has to get permission. If he wants to sell some jewelry or other significant household or personal uh, items that she has, he has to get permission from the probate court to do that. And I can tell you now that one of the ways that Alan will be helped, and most family members are helped, are from the staff at the probate court. It's really because the staff is knowledgeable and helpful that people can do this without the assistance of attorneys. Um, they provide a lot of guidance, and they will always tell you that they're not providing legal advice, but they give you every other piece of advice that they can. So <clears throat> Alan goes about managing Susan's affairs, making decisions for her. Uh, by the next year, he has to file an accounting, which explains to the court and all the other parties uh, what money has come in, how the money has gone out, how he has spent the money on Susan's behalf, and perhaps even what decisions he's made about um, the investments that they have. As conservative person, he'll also need to file a report <coughs> discussing uh, Susan's current health condition and any progress that she might have made. Because at this point, as the judge said earlier, it's important to know that the conservator really has to always be mindful of the conserved person. And in this situation, it might seem easy because it's a husband and a wife, but there's always um, the need to be mindful of uh, the independence and the, um, the righteousness of the conserved person. So th this situation with uh, Alan and Susan doesn't really provide an opportunity to discuss uh, sometimes the discord that happens between the conservator and a conserved person. And even if it's relative, sometimes there's, it doesn't always go that smoothly. Um, because the goal of the conservatorship, the goal of the court order from the, from the court is always to order the least restrictive means of intervention. So in this fact pattern, Susan wasn't really able to do much for herself. But in other instances, the conserved person might be able to. For example, let's just say we had a 40-year-old male. He's been battling mental illness and substance abuse for most of his life. He's estranged from his family, and he's living alone in an apartment. One of his neighbors notices that there haven't been lights on in the apartment a long time. He sees the guy coming and going. Maybe he sees candles lit. He sees the guy going through the garbage cans. He's a little confused about his behavior. He might call the police. He might call the town social worker. In either case, the town social worker might come out, vi take a visit with this gentleman, and if she sees that he's really um, at risk, she might call um, the State Department of Social Services, Department of Protective Services for the disabled and the elderly. And they may come out and do an investigation. And uh, long story short, they may, after investigating, the situation, they may file a petition for an involuntary conservator. I feel like this gentleman is just not capable of making good decisions. He's, he's, uh, his apartment is dark because he hasn't paid his electric bill. He's in the process of getting evicted, and um, he's really in bad shape. So in this instance, you know, the state might file a petition. They might ask for a conservative person in the state, but the judge might say, you know what? Um, we just need a conservator of estate here. And in fact, you know, if we want to make this the least restrictive, we might just have the conservator of estate get his income 
pay his rent, pay his utilities, and then at that point, allow this person to have the rest of the funds and spend them as he chooses. So the whole idea would be to give this person as much independence as possible. So the conservator of a state may also be told, you're the one to file all the paperwork so that this gentleman doesn't lose his benefits, his federal benefits, his state benefits, and that way we know that he has food stamps. And that might be all that the gentleman wants, and that might be all the judge uh, really wants to sort of impose on him. Um, okay. So as the judge said, sometimes people come in and they're looking for a voluntary conservatorship. And so in that instance, the judge is really looking for the opposite. He's not looking for somebody who's incapable of making decisions, but he really in, you know, makes an inquiry of this person as to why would you want to give up the rights that you have? And um, are you capable of, of giving up these rights? And sometimes, sometimes people want to do that. They don't want to do a power of attorney. They don't want to do a health care rep. But sometimes their life has been so chaotic they're aware of that. They might maybe just have like a gambling addiction. And they might come in and say, here's my sister. She's really been a nag my whole life. But I realize at this point, I need her. And she's willing to make sure that my life goes a little bit more smoothly now. Um, and so that's sometimes how you end up with the voluntary conservator person. In that instance, the conservator still functions as a conservator would in an involuntary case, but the conservative person has the right to terminate the conservatorship. They just have to send a letter to the court, and then the conservatorship ends within 30 days. Um, so I also mentioned that when you're doing your power of attorney document, sometimes you want to put in there that you uh, recognize that you might be conserved anyway. And there are some instances when you have um, a valid power of attorney, but you end up being the respondent in the conservatorship petition. And that often happens when the agent, the person that you've selected to manage your finances, mishandles your funds. So we could take another example. Let's just say we have a mother. She's divorced many years. She has two daughters. She's a very wealthy woman living in her own home. She has 24-hour aides. At this point, she's not able to uh, manage her affairs. She selects daughter number one to be her power of attorney. Daughter number one lives nearby. She has her own family, but she's managing mom's finances. She's coordinating the aides that are in the home. Daughter number two lives in Florida and comes up for a visit. She comes to visit mom and the aides tell her, oh, well, we haven't been paid in a couple of weeks. Or she sees bills on the table that haven't been paid, and daughter number one has a new addition on her house. It's an exaggerated set of facts. But in that circumstance, daughter number two may come to the probate court and say, yes, mother has a, a POA, and it's a valid POA, but we have grounds here to sort of supersede the power of attorney and a, an appointed conservator. In that instance, the court is likely to appoint a conservator and not likely to port, appoint daughter number two, but more likely to appoint a third, a third party, a neutral party, um, to take care of mom's finances. Um, let's see. I think uh, I want to close now so we have time for attorney currents and some questions, but I, I do want to say that the probate court realizes so often when families come in that it's a difficult time. It's a tough time for everybody. It's really hard uh, as a child to come in with a conservatorship petition sort of against a parent or for a parent to come in with a conservative petition against an adult child. So um, the, sh the staff is generally very compassionate, but very often the conservatorship benefits everybody. It sets some rules. It sets some boundaries for the family members. Thank you, Kathleen. How about a round of applause? <laughs>
I, I just had uh, one comment. Uh, it's with regard to an involuntary conservatorship. An in involuntary conservator uh, of the estate, to, to be appointed involuntary conservator of the estate, the, the court um, looks for clear and convincing evidence, which is what the law requires, that the respondent has a mental, emotional, or physical condition that results in the respondent being unable to receive and evaluate information. Um, the respondent also may have an inability to communicate uh, or make financial decisions, even if there's appropriate assistance uh, available. If the person is unable to perform those functions of inherent managing, management of their finances, uh, then they will probably have a conservator appointed. In addition, there must be evidence that the respondent's property rights are going to be wasted or in some way dissipated so that they're going to lose property, that they're, they're giving their property away to anybody who knocks on the door when they actually need their, their, their cash to take care of themselves. They need a caretaker in the home, and they're giving thousands of dollars to some stranger who knocks on the door. Um, there must be specific evidence. Clear and convincing evidence is a high standard. There must be s specific evidence. Generally, the evidence consists of, as, as uh, Kathleen said, medical evidence, which we, we need, and a testimony of others, and it could be family members and it could be others. Um, so that's, that's the evidence we need for the appointment of a conservator of the estate, generally. Uh, with regard to the conservator of a person, same, same standard. It's the respondent has a mental, physical, um, uh, or emotional condition that prevents them from um, receiving and evaluating information and communicating decisions necessary to uh, a, a afford them of appropriate assistance or um, meet their uh, personal needs, their, their essential personal needs. If they can't make those decisions, then a conservator will be appointed. Again, there must be clear and convincing evidence that they can't meet their personal needs with, with assistance. Um, there must be specific examples of this as well. And um, some of the duties I just would, would generally tell you, as Kathleen said, for the conservator of the estate would be management of real property, management of tangible property, management of stocks and bonds and other finances, litigation. The conservator of the estate would might handle litigation that was pending, personal and family maintenance. Uh, if, if a family member needs support from the person who's conserved, the, the conservator may be handling that and then receipt of benefits from governmental programs. Um, taxes as, as well, they, the conservator would handle that. Um, duties of a conservator of the person are a little different. They would involve personal care, comfort, and safety and maintenance of the respondent, the person who's conserved, and they would assure consent to medical or professional care, and they would establish residence with, with approval of the court. They cannot move the conserved person unless they have approval of the court. So, Conservator, the person may think mom or dad is conserved. They need to be in um, a, a facility that has uh, assisted living uh, and, and people can care for them there. They can't just on their own move them. They have to ask the court, can I move mom or dad from home to this assisted living facility or to this, this uh, convalescent home? Uh, they would also care for personal effects. So those are some of the, just some general, general principles that I thought you should know. So without further ado, uh, Jay Kearns with regard to Title 19. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you, Owen. Uh, before I get started, I want to thank Owen because he has invested hours in this project. The four nights, the nights that he meets with the attorneys before they come and present to you, he's been the energy and the driving force behind this public service, and I want to thank him. So I'd like a great applause. As the closer, I get to do that. Okay, there's two handouts. Uh, one is it uh, has exempt assets on it, and it says asset protection, and it says income protection. Has everybody got one? It's one sheet of paper. And then we also have our fact pattern. Let's imagine for a second that you were brought to a casino and you were told that you had to bet your life savings and you didn't know the rules of the game. That's what happens to people when they're confronted with paying for long-term care. Because if they don't have the insurance, if they don't have the veterans benefits, if Medicare is not gonna pay for it, you will. 
And it's a very expensive proposition when a lot of the area nursing homes are now reaching close to $500 a day. And the, the mystery out there is some people think, well, Medicare is going to pay for it. Medicare pays up to 100 days. And the way that it works is if you go into a hospital and you spend at least three nights there, you're guaranteed 20 days in the nursing home where the government pays 100%. After day 21, there's a deductible. But the nursing home, as the independent evaluator, has to keep determining whether or not Medicare should pay, meaning you're being rehabilitated, or if you are not, then Medicare is shut off. And that's when it becomes self-pay. And that's when people get sticker shock when the nursing home says, uh, like the landlord, I'd need a $15,000 security deposit. And by the way, today's November 1st, I'd like another $15,000 for the month of November. So it's almost like you're buying a small car. So be that as it may, I am going to walk you through the maze of Medicaid. And so we're going to go to the exempt assets list. So first and foremost, on the exempt assets, real estate is exempt if the Medicaid applicant is living in the home or they have a spouse in the house, like the cat in the hat. B, a car is protected. The applicant can only keep one. Personal possessions. The state of Connecticut is not going to look in your window and say, hey, I like that grandfather's clock in that nice oriental rug that you have in the kitchen. Uh, your personal possessions are exempt. Uh, the Medicaid applicant can only have $1,600. You may have heard that before, but remember that number. The burial costs, it's a little confusing here, and so I want to try and, again, demystify things. Uh, prior to August 1st of last year, the maximum that you could have in an irrevocable burial contract was $5,400. But if you're not familiar with the statute, here's how it works. It's $5,400 for the funeral home and the staff. There's another trust over here, which is what I call the merchandise, which might be the casket, the vault, the prayer cards, and all of the different merchandise that you are purchasing from the funeral director, including the opening of the grave, the closing of the grave, the urn, whatever it is that you're spending. The rules have changed. It's now $8,000, but again, it's $8,000 for the services, and it's unlimited on the merchandise. So the point of the story is, can you have a $16,000 funeral? The answer is yes, because $8,000 is for the staff, and the $8,000 is for the merchandise. Moving along, the burial plot is exempt. There's got to be a place to put you. And Here's where it gets a little dicey, and that is we have the cash surrender value of life insurance provided that the total face values do not exceed $1,500. So, you know, they're thinking back in the 60s when the, the insurance guy used to go door to door collecting the premiums and people did have $1,500 life insurance policies, although uh, those days are well over. So what we're simply saying is if the face value of a whole life policy that has a cash surrender value exceeds $1,500, you will never ever be eligible for Medicaid. Sometimes people tell me this, and that is, well, my husband's only got a small policy. Well, if it's a small policy, $2,000, $2,500, $3,000, $5,000, pick a number above $1,500, they will never ever qualify for Medicaid. Okay? So, Let's just talk about an individual because that's quick to uh, discuss. And that is, if we have somebody living in their home and they apply for one of the four home care for elders programs, there's four, um, they can own the house, but the state will put a lien on it because they want to get paid back when the person leaves the house and perhaps goes to the nursing home. Or if the person dies, the state will get paid back. Some people have this misperception that the nursing home is like a vacuum cleaner and it's going to come and vacuum all the money out of your pocket or your purse. It, it doesn't do that. It's more like a landlord-tenant relationship. 
So when it comes to the home care for elders programs, yes, you can live in your house and you can receive one of the four different types of assistance. I am not getting into that this evening. I don't have enough time. My goal is to educate you on the basics. So uh, with the fact pattern in mind, before we get there, uh, let's briefly discuss the Allen and Susan situation by going into the asset protection part of the one page sheet. So if you have a couple, you pool the assets. So whatever belongs to Allen, whatever belongs to Susan, solely, jointly, however it's owned, it's all pooled together. And currently the rule is that the spouse in the house is entitled to at least $24,180 up to one half of the value of the assets, which is capped at $120,900. So let's run through a couple scenarios. Let's pretend, ignoring the fact sheet, that Alan and Susan have $25,000. How much do we have to spend on the nursing home? Just enough to get down to the $24,180 because that is an amount that is guaranteed the spouse in the house. If they have 100,000, it's half, 50, 50. If it's $400,000, then the spouse in the house in all 50 states gets to keep $120,900 because Medicaid is a federal program in all 50 states, no exceptions. That's the rule, okay? CMS, which stands for the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services in Baltimore, Maryland, contracts with every state's agency. With us, it's DSS, Department of Social Services. And underneath this compact, it's called the Federal State Compact, the state government has said, we agree to administer the Medicaid program in accordance with the federal rules. Sometimes you have various nuances or interpretations on different rules between the states. Uh, in terms of if somebody had a family business in some states, that might be exempt. In other states, it may not be. But the main point here is that if we have Alan and Susan from the exempt assets right off the bat, we know that Alan can stay in the house with all the furniture and they're not going to grab that. And we also know that Alan has some asset protection here where he's guaranteed a certain amount. Because if you're the state of Connecticut, do you want to have one person on Medicaid or do you want to have both? The answer is you want one. So that's why we build in these protections. And my goal tonight is to make sure that you understand your home is your castle. If you have a spouse that goes in the nursing home, you get to keep the house, it's protected. And there's a certain amount of assets. Here's the formula right here. And then also getting into the income protection. There's an income protection for the spouse in the house as well. Prior to 1988, we would have what was called the name on the instrument rule. And here's what that meant. And that is, if we had Alan, and Alan worked and made a lot of money, and meanwhile, Susan stayed at home raising the children and was out of the workforce, and therefore Susan had a smaller amount of income, and Alan went into the nursing home with a larger amount of income, then Susan would be devastated before 1988 because it was the name on the instrument rule and Alan's income checks went to the nursing home. To combat that, the whole purpose of these rules is to guard against spousal impoverishment. We don't want to impoverish the community spouse. So that's why the home is protected, that's why there's an amount of assets protected, and that's why the income is protected. So let's just run through the income protection because I want to make sure that you understand that. If we quickly go to our fact pattern and on the last page, look at the monthly income. And if we have Susan going into the nursing home, because remember, Kathleen said that she had suffered a stroke, you're going to see that Alan has Social Security of $1,500. But if you go down to B1, where it says 150% of the federal poverty level for a two-person household, $2,030. We're simply saying is 
that Allen is guaranteed income in the amount of 2030. And if he didn't have enough assets to generate income to bring it up to the 2030, then we would be diverting income from Susan out of the nursing home to bring Allen up to that $2,030 figure. Does everybody understand that? Here's the way it works, and that is if we have Susan going into the convalescent home and Allen's got the joint assets, he's the conservator for his wife's assets, he's got his own assets, he has to spend down his assets down to that $120,900 mark under federal law. So he loses his assets. But if he doesn't have enough income as the community spouse, then it must be diverted out of the nursing home into his pocket to support him in the community. Because every spouse has a duty to support the other spouse. It's in the family law section, right, Kathleen? <laughs> All right, B2. There's a shelter allowance. So Alan's guaranteed 20, 30 every single month just to wake up in the morning. But he's got a house, and he's got cable TV, and he's got real estate taxes, and he's got homeowner's insurance. He's got heat, hot water, he's got all kinds of those type of expenses. And what we're simply saying here is the 609 figure is a floor. So every single month, and the state DSS ca uh, worker has to calculate these figures. So when you apply for Medicaid and you have a spouse, they will ask you, give me a copy of the real estate tax bill because I want to figure out what the monthly taxes are to calculate the shelter allowance. And they have a standard utility allowance, which is the heat, the hot water, electricity, etc. cetera. And, um, they would also want to see your homeowner's insurance policy because they also calculate the monthly homeowner's insurance amounts. Now, the numbers here are not that important. I don't want anybody to say, aha, I've got Her Kearns's handout, and so now I know all the numbers and I'm going to memorize them. The asset am amounts go up every January 1st. The income amounts go up every July 1st with the cost of living. So memorizing the numbers is not really important. It doesn't help you. But again, the main thrust of my presentation tonight is your home is your castle. There's an asset protection. And there's an income protection. Most people learn about the asset protection. Oh, I can only have half or $120,000. That's not as important as the income one. All right, let's take a look at our scenario here. And on the family assets, we have the West Hartford home. The HELOC is a home equity line of credit, for those of you who don't have that on your house. Alan's got a car. Susan's got a car. We have a joint brokerage account, $400,000. Alan's got a 401k of $300,000. We have the joint bank account of $75,000. We have Alan's life insurance policy. We have Susan's life insurance policy. First thing we want to do is do what? Well, I get rid of the life insurance, and one of the ideas that we might have is, I think it might be three years ago now, the state legislature allows you to assign your life insurance policies to the local funeral home that you would use and change the beneficiary from, you know, between Susan and Alan to the funeral home, so the funeral home would own the policy. Susan might be the insured, and the funeral home gets the money, upon Susan's demise, although that $50,000 might be a little pricey for a funeral. <laughs> Another option might be to cash it out. You can always borrow against it and take all the money out of it, so it's not worth anything. But those are some of the options that you want to examine with a life insurance policy. But in the main, don't we really want to get everything out of Susan's name? One of the things I tell clients is, look, Susan's never, ever going to qualify for Medicaid unless she's down to $1,600. It's right there in exempt assets. Susan gets to keep $1,600 if she's the Medicaid applicant. So we're in a hurry to get the assets out of Susan and Alan's name 
and to Alan's name. Okay? Second thing is, how is Susan going to be managing any of the assets in her name if she's had this massive stroke and she's not really competent? It's going to happen through a power of attorney. If they had a trust, and you know, I'm just recalling the previous estate planning sessions that you had, or even tonight, Kathleen, talking about the conservatorships. Sometimes what I do uh, in the uh, conservatorship proceeding, if my clients had not done previous planning, is there is a conservator gifting statute. It's 45A, 655E, and I will go in and petition the probate court that this is an exempt transaction. It does not violate the Medicaid rules because Alan's always on the hook to pay for his wife's care until he gets down to the one twenty nine hundred dollars and therefore judge egan here's my petition this is an exempt transfer it doesn't violate the rules of medicaid and the statute requires that notice be sent to my friends at the department of social services they don't usually come <laughs> so that's how we would be looking at moving the house we have a heloc and we all know, if, if we do quickly do the math and we say, okay, we have the brokerage account, we have Allen's 401k, and we've got $75,000 in the uh, bank account. I'm not including anything else. We have $775,000 worth of assets. One of the first things I'm going to say to Allen is, I want to pay off the mortgage. Is that a gift to anybody? We didn't give any gifts to anybody. We paid a debt. All right, so we'd be looking at paying off any credit cards, home equity lines of credit, that type of stuff. Let's take a look at the 401k. True or false, the 401k is income. Yeah. If we pull it out of the 401k, what happens? Uncle Sam says it's income. We've got to pay income taxes on it, right? True or false, is it an asset? Yeah. So in the Medicaid rules, it says that the state can never touch the income of the community spouse. And we know why. So if we took Allen's 401k and we transformed it into an IRA rollover and then did an immediate annuity where we're taking a look at Allen's life expectancy tables and we're saying he's got XYZ number of years left, and we take his $300,000 and we divide it by the number of months in XYZ years, we can do an immediate annuity where we give the money to an insurance company and much like a pension, just like a pension plan, Alan is now receiving a monthly check and we got rid of $300,000. Did we gift it to anybody? No. Can the DSS do anything about that? No. Why? Because it's retirement income. I took a retirement asset and transformed it into a stream of income, which they can't touch. Now, I, I had this argument with a client the other day, and I said we have to be very careful when we do this because although you're supposed to get to $2,030 a month, if we now have Alan with his $1,500 of Social Security, and now he's got a annuity check coming every single month, well, there's not going to be a diversion from Susan's Social Security to Alan. But when we're taking a $300,000 asset that we don't have to spend on the nursing home and we're transforming it into a stream of income for Alan, I would recommend that to him very highly and say, forget about any diversion from your spouse. Because the problem with the diversion from your spouse is if your spouse dies, there is no money to be diverted. There's no more income to be diverted. So a bird in the hand is sometimes worth more than a hypothetical one. Okay, so we've paid off the mortgage. We've made the $300,000 disappear. So now we're really looking at the cars. You know, I, I probably say to Alan, look, you can't drive two cars at once. And so what you might want to do is trade the two older cars in for a new car and just have one car and make it a nice one. And frequently I'll tell clients that and they'll say, oh, my car is fine. What year is it? Oh, it's 10 years old. No, because then when it starts falling apart, 
you don't want to have the person already spent down to the $120,000 and now they have to go out and buy the car. The time is to go buy the car now. Speaking of funerals, you know, if we have the $400,000, uh, it's now $300,000 in the brokerage account because we took a hundred and spent it on the mortgage and we have $300,000 there and we have $75,000 in the bank account. A quick way to get rid of a lot of money is to prepay the funerals because all of us are going to exit. And it's just a question of which manner we're going to do it in. Uh, the cremations run, you know, on the real, real low side, maybe $2,000. Uh, I would say the average is in between $3,500 to $7,500 on cremations. But the burials are running uh, in around $15,000. And so you can get rid of $30,000 by prepaying the uh, Allen and Susan's funeral. Let's twist the facts a little bit. Let's pretend that uh, David, age 45, is disabled. And let's suppose he lives with Allen and Susan. Can I prepay for three funerals? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, I can transfer every single asset on this sheet of paper to David because he's a disabled child. It's the biggest loophole in the Medicaid law. But then the problem is, have we jumped from one frying pan to another frying pan because if David is receiving Medicaid assistance and all of a sudden he's got assets, he's got to pay the state back. So we have to look before we leap. All right? Let's go back to the exempt assets on the real estate because I just want to run through some scenarios that I frequently run into. And, and that is that let's suppose somebody goes into the convalescent home and it looks like they're going to be coming home after four or five months. There's a case out of Illinois called the Connor case. And Mrs. Connor went into the, the, the uh, convalescent home in Illinois and a bank was named as the conservator and guess what they did? They sold Mrs. Connor's house while she was in the nursing home thinking she wasn't coming home. And so in this particular situation, if we had Alan or Susan was single and they were going to be coming home, they could write letters to DSS saying, you know, I intend to come home and have the doctor write a letter saying, I intend to come home. And as a result, that house is exempt and doesn't count to disqualify somebody from Medicaid as long as they truly have the intent to come home. Next up is, okay, if we have certain family members there, it is exempt. Well, we have the spouse in the house, that's the first one. If we have a child under 21, not age 18, it's 21. <coughs> Next, if we have a blind or permanently disabled child, again, not only can we transfer the house, we can transfer any assets at all. Uh, next up, which is rare, but I see it every once in a while, and that is the two old bachelors that live together who are brothers, or it could be a brother and a sister or two elderly sisters that live together that inherited the house from mom or dad. One has to go in the convalescent home, and the rule is as long as for a year they have jointly owned the house and occupied the house, it's an exempt transfer to transfer the house to the healthy sibling. There's one here that is not really an exempt transfer, but I'm going to tell you about it because it's one that I commonly see, and that is when the son or daughter moves into the house with mom or dad. And the rule is if the son or daughter has moved into the house with mom or dad and has lived there for at least two years, that's the first prong of the test, and the second prong is that they have provided care to mom or dad which has avoided the need of institutionalizing them in the nursing home, that's an exempt transfer from mom or dad to son or daughter. But on that one, you have to be very careful because the state is going to want to see the medical records. And what I always do is get a letter from mom or dad's personal physician saying, it's me, Dr. Zhivago. I have been the doctor for Susan for the last 25 years. And in my professional medical opinion, if Alan, uh, let's David, uh, or we'll pick Jennifer, 
you know, if, if David or Jennifer had not resided in the house for those two years and provided care to Susan during that time frame, Susan would certainly have been institutionalized at least those two years ago. So I think by, you know, belaboring on the exempt nature of the real estate a little bit, I gave you a flavor of different things that we can do. Uh, otherwise, another way to think about the exempt asset list, it's a shopping list. Because if we're going to be spending down the money, the thing I always say to my client is, at some point in time, you're not going to have it anymore. So what are the things that you would like? How about the new car? How about some new furniture? How about some new appliances? Do we need insulated windows? How about the siding? How's the roof doing? How's the furnace? Do you need central air? So one time Judge Berman said, well, Mr. Kearns went out and redecorated the whole house. <laughs> but that's the idea. Because either you're going to spend it on your house or you're going to spend it on the other house. The other house is called the nursing home. And it's your choice. So that's what you're really looking at here in terms of a, with the real estate, should you be making home improvements? Anybody who owns a house always has some kind of improvement that they need to make. Uh, that's why we have Home Depot. Uh, the new car is the automobile, personal possessions, furniture, appliances, uh, the burial costs, the burial plots, etc. The one thing I always caution everybody is don't be abusive. I have represented people in the past where they have abused it and they got into trouble. You know, somebody always say, well, what if I lost the money at the casino? I say, yeah, come on. You know, the state doesn't care if you lost it at the casino or not. They are tracking your monthly statements, and it's much like an IRS audit. They have the ability to look at 60 months' worth of your statements. And if they see a pattern, they will question the pattern. Once upon a time, I had a client who sent out 12 $500 checks to the grandchildren, of course, you know, it was during the uh, two weeks before the Medicaid application started. Uh, and, of course, I got a call from my favorite state worker saying, uh, I'm working on Mrs. Smith's application. I noticed these 12 $500 checks. Can you explain to me what that was? Uh, I've had people, you know, go out and buy all kinds of really expensive jewelry. And that is problematic for clients. And so you really have to be careful because in the nature of this audit, the state's not got the job of chasing after the money. The caseworker just says either approved or deny. The state law is that the nursing home has the right to sue the transferee. And by the way, I always run into this situation. Somebody will say, but Attorney Kearns, the gift tax law says that we can give $14,000 per person. Sure. I can give $14,000 to everybody in this room or people watching on TV. But that's got nothing to do with Medicaid law. Medicaid law, they're looking to see if you gave away assets within that 60-day time frame. And sometimes I've been able to rebut the presumption saying that, you know, it was a standard practice where the folks gave $25,000 to each of the kids. Here's proof that they did it with the other children. The gift was made. It was a massive stroke. Two months later, nobody knew it was coming. It was like a bolt that came out of the sky, like a thunderbolt. And I've been able to rebut the presumption. But in the main, most of the time, people know that mom or dad is getting fuzzy. They're getting forgetful. They're getting confused. They're having troubles with the checkbook. And that's when the handwriting's on the wall. You know, you need to do some planning. In this particular area of the law, as in all of the different topics that have been touched on this series. It's like Peter Pan and Never Neverland. Uh, you know, I have clients who sometimes don't prepare, they don't do documents, I'm not going to get sick, the guy down the street is, I'm not going to die, somebody else is, I'm not going to end up in the nursing home. It's procrastination, it's avoidance, it's denial. That's really what it comes down to. And in this particular area, time is your enemy. And you want to do the planning while you are healthy. You don't want to wait for the diagnosis where somebody says, well, you have Parkinson's, you have Alzheimer's, or you have vascular dementia or something else going on. I call that the wheel of misfortune. Uh, it can happen to anybody here. And so you just have to be vigilant about your money. And as I said earlier, 
You know, you wouldn't go into a casino and start betting your life savings on games where you didn't know the rules. And it's the same thing about Title 19. Title 19, the reason why it's called Title 19 is because if you look at the Social Security Act, Title 18 is called Medicare, Title 19 is called Medicaid. So now you know that for your trivial pursuit. But I am going to stop talking now because I could talk forever about Medicaid. And I'm going to invite Judge Egan to come back up. And then we have time for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Kathleen. How about another round of applause for both of them? Thank you. As we close uh, this portion of our fourth, se uh, fourth session of this four-part series, I would like to thank the library board for continuing to allow us to present this program and, and joining us in this po program, as well as the staff here at the Noah Webster Library who have hosted us. I would also like to, to thank um, all my staff at the probate court, uh, led by Laurie Rico, who has uh, been the clerk there for over 30 years. They are an excellent staff, and they have also helped uh, with me, helped me with the preparation for this program. Finally, I'd like to thank and all the panelists in this room who kindly contributed uh, their time and expertise and knowledge in preparing uh, for this evening's program. And um, now we can entertain questions. I'm going to ask uh, Jay and Kathleen to come and join me here at the podium, and then we'll take questions one at a time. Uh, I'm going to ask them to please repeat the question for the audience, and then um, um, we'll, we'll take them again one at, one at a time. Yes, sir. Oh, um, <laughs> but find a good way to, to enter into this conversation. Kathleen? Uh, so the gentleman said, what if, is it helpful uh, to have a strong POA, POA and a strong health care proxy? And, and I would say, say yes, yes, those generally are the tools that you should have. And if they, they are working, working they then you can avoid being concerned. Mr. Chairman, the camera in front of me. So can I take off my head? No. Would I have to worry about my assets? Could you repeat the question again? Would I have to worry about giving away assets if my income, my income is about what a nursing home cost would be like $150,000 a year? The, the question, question is, is, do I have, have to worry about the nursing home if our joint income equals the cost of the nursing home per year? About my assets, not about the nursing home. Do I have to worry about giving away assets, provided my income is that high? So the, the question is, do I have to worry about giving away my assets if my income is high enough to cover the cost of the nursing home? The dilemma I would see there is, if you went into the nursing home, does your wife have enough income to cover the cost of her housing and her shelter? Because otherwise, she's going to have to eat into those assets to support herself. So for example, if the nursing home was $150,000 plus a year, and that was your income, and the $150,000 is going towards the nursing home, the question is, what do we have left over to pay the real estate taxes on the house, the maintenance costs, somebody to clean out the gutters, somebody to rake the leaves, cut the grass, and do all the types of maintenance, you know, the oil burner, repairman, all that type of stuff. So I don't think that you can really look at it in terms of, I think my income is going to cover my cost of care. You really have to look at the expenses of both houses the nursing home, and the marital residence. Thank you. The bill of prices go up. Yes, sir. Um, prices go up. As a conservative person in voluntary conservatorship, um, are there any legal restrictions on the conservative person? Like, is that person still allowed to vote? Is that person still allowed to drive? Things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a great question. Um, uh, so generally, when that person gets conserved, either uh, they're conserved of a state or they're conserved of person, 
the orders that come down from the probate judge are very specific about what the conservator has the right to do. And certainly the conserved person is, never loses the right to vote. Um, and in terms of driving, uh, I think it's a case-by-case a, a -case basis. Sometimes um, if the conservative person, not like, they're not likely to be able to drive, but not necessarily so. It's, it really is a case-by-case -case basis because there's different levels of need that people have and they can serve for different reasons. So that's not in the order that it's not prohibited? Exactly. Mm -hmm. the, the conservator is only in charge of what the judge delineates that the conservator's duties are. Um, and just to follow up with that, the, the least restrictive, um, well, the, the conservator only handles the affairs of the conserved person that are assigned to them by the court, and the court tries to leave the person with as much control of their life as they possibly can, um, but they're trying to protect that person. So, okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm a little confused about the look back of five years versus you said something about 60 days. Mm -hmm. Oh, 60, 60 months. months. 60 months. Oh, okay. 60 months. Mm -hmm. But what if you're, but what you're doing, you're changing all these assets, like, you know, moving things around, selling the two cars and all that. Can you do all of that and if the, the look back won't hit that? Let's start with what is the look back period. The look back period starts on the day that you file the application, which is typically when the person in the nursing home is down to $1,600, whether they're single or part of a couple. And if they have a spouse, that spouse is down to either one half the value of the assets or the $120,000. All right. So at that time, they're going back and they're doing a look back. And the state is looking for what? Yeah. Right, it's a four-letter word. Gift. Nowhere did I say that we were giving gifts, did I? No. Nope. All I did was talk about transforming things and spending money and paying down debt. So is the state going to have a problem with somebody paying off their mortgage? No. no. Are they going to have a problem with somebody uh, prepaying their funeral? The answer is no. You know why? Because the state's not in the business of paying people's funerals. As a matter of fact, the rule is $1,200, but in the budget, it was supposed to be knocked down to $900 that the state will give a family to pay for somebody's funeral who was on Medicaid. So you really want to pay for your funeral in advance. Correct. But that's the 60-month or five-year look back. Okay. Yes, ma'am. The question is, how does asset protection apply for single people? Sometimes I have clients who are single saying, I don't care. It's my money. Spend it all on me. Sometimes I have clients who are single saying, I want to buy a long-term care policy because this way, if I need home care, they'll take care of me in my home. If I need to go to adult daycare, they'll pay for the adult daycare where the van comes and picks me up in the morning and brings me back at home. They'll pay for assisted living. They'll pay for the nursing home. So the whole spectrum of long-term care can be covered by the long-term care insurance. And sometimes I have clients saying, well, you know, what if I don't use it? My response is, do you have car insurance? Yeah. And what are we protecting with the car insurance? Well, in the event there's a car crash and I lose the value of the car or I hurt somebody else, I have car insurance. Have you got homeowner's insurance? Yeah, in the event my house burns down. Why don't you have long-term care insurance? Because the odds are one in three that all of us are going to end up in a nursing home. And number three is you could choose a number of devices, such as using a trust or simply taking assets and retitling them in other people's names, which I think is very dangerous because if that person goes into the nursing home or gets into a car accident and hits somebody with their car, then your assets are at risk. Uh, what about house and the uh, minimum assets? With a house, 
uh, here's the danger with the house, and, and that is it's really a capital gains tax issue. And a lot of times I'll ask people, how much did you spend, uh, how much did you pay for your house? And everybody cracks into this big smile like the Cheshire Cat. Well, I bought my house in West Hartford in 1960. Yeah, I bought it for $12,000. Wow, such a deal. And what's it worth today? It's worth $300,000. And I'll tell them, under Section 1015 of the Internal Revenue Code, when they gift the house to the kids, the kids get it $12,000. And what happens when the kids sell the house? They pay the capital gains tax. That's the capital gains tax trap. So there's a way to draft trusts. Um, the case is called the Hearn versus Thomas. It was my trust where the Supreme Court in a six to one decision upheld my trust and said that Mr. Blumenthal could not get the money out of a trust and Mrs. O'Hearn had to be put on Medicaid. So it's really trust, give it outright, or buy long-term care insurance. Yes, ma'am. If one already has a conservatorship, do you have to, does it go through probate also? If one already... If you already have the document. Do you still have to do what um, Attorney Barry was saying? I think I So you were talking about when I said sometimes just to cover all your bases, you nominate somebody who would serve as your conservator if you should get conserved? You already so, have a conservator. So if you're already conserved. No, you're not conserved. You have a document. If something happens, if you have Okay, so normally you don't have a conservatorship document. You might have a power of attorney or you might have a health care representative form, and you're designating who you want to take care of you, either take care of your finances or your personal affairs. So, and you might say, um, and by the way, if I should get conserved anyway, this is the person whom I would like to serve as my conservator but that's only there in your documents. If you somehow get conserved by the probate court, um, if you're gonna get conserved, the process still needs to happen. Uh, no one's gonna just conserve you without you having to uh, get the full justice and the full due process that you're entitled to as the respondent. So. Just to follow up on that, um, the document that <coughs> Kathleen's talking about is a designation of a conservator. Yes and you would present it at a hearing for the appointment of a conservator, and it is something that the, the court would consider. They may not appoint that person, for instance, if that person was incompetent themselves, or if that person um, w w had, had, uh, uh, your, did not have your best interests at heart. The court is always focused on your interest if you're, you're the one who's gonna be conserved. But it is a document that they will consider, and generally, yes, you would appoint the person that you've named in that document. Okay. Yes, sir. I was very clear, relationship, power of authority with conservation. If I have power of authority, I really don't need a conservator. If power of authority finds the stadium, has some problem, he can apply and say, oh, I don't have time to do I want to announce you, my conservator. So are you asking us, so if you have a power of attorney, yes. then why would you need a conservator? Yes. Okay. So normally you would not need a conservator, and that's the whole idea, is to uh, take charge of the person who will be making decisions for you yes. if not someday, if you're not able to. And yes. so the power of attorney is that document that you've created. No so normally you, you, you wouldn't even have to get to the probate court, but let's just say you ended up in the hospital and nobody knew that you had these documents, a conservatorship petition might get filed, but that power of attorney gets brought into court. And one of the um, initial inquiries that the judge makes is, do you have a power of attorney already? Is it valid? And is the person that you nominated to be your agent available and willing to serve as your agent? And if so, then um, the petition for the conservatorship would get dismissed and you would not be under the jurisdiction of the uh, probate court, and your power of attorney would, func would, would come into play. Okay, other. Where do you say the conservator? Let me follow up on that. Attorney Barry also gave an example when she 
um, gave her, her um, discussion regarding conservatorship. She said that um, a, I, I believe a power of attorney who was appointed uh, might use the money inappropriately to put an addition on their house. So uh, in that case, you'd want the power of attorney removed and you'd want to appoint a conservator. So you'd need a conservator. Um, it, the, the power of attorney is really an agent and, and can act in conjunction with the person who's given them the power of attorney. So the power of attorney could write checks against a bank account and the person themselves could continue to write checks. Um, if the, the person who gave the power of attorney is, is not of their right mind and they're giving checks to anybody who comes to the door and they're giving away all their assets, then, then, uh, then the person who has the power of attorney who loves that person may say, I can't have mom or dad doing that. They, I need to protect them. They need to protect them against themselves. They'll go into the court and say, please appoint me as conservator of my mother and father, my mother or father or whomever it is. And, and I, I then take control of, of those assets. And it doesn't matter if, if mom or dad writes a check. Once a conservator is appointed, it's only the conservator's signature that counts. Okay. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yes. Other one more question. A person who applied to have a conservator have to pay to probate court? To, to apply? apply? Yes. yes, there's a fee. I believe it's $250. And plus expensive to the lawyers. Uh, um, yep. Yep. If you have a lawyer, lawyers generally get paid and they... <laughs> yeah. So you'd have to pay for the lawyers, yeah. And then you, you also would have to have medical evidence. So a doctor would have to... Uh, be present to give all, all of that evidence has to be uh, brought to court to, to uh, make the application. Okay. Is there anyone else? Yes, sir. Uh, first, thank you. Oh, uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm coming away with a huge takeaway, which is uh, much like you should see a doctor for a checkup, probably should see an attorney in the uh, state field. Um, if you have any size aspect. Um, what, and, I, and I apologize for the question, um, maybe a little out of bounds. What would that kind of checkup to go into an attorney and you know show assets, show family, show plans, and come out with a plan? What, what, you know, what might you expect? The question is, if you were to hire an attorney to do the planning, what might you expect in terms of fees? Well, we're not personal injury lawyers, so we don't take a third of your money. <laughs> so a lot of times people think, it's a free consultation. And in our office, we don't do free consultations. Uh, we, we try and be very efficient and very economical with people's money. So when somebody calls our office, they're told to meet with myself or one of the two associates, it's $400. And what we do is we send them a questionnaire in advance and when the questionnaire is a list of things to bring, because I ask them to bring copies of bank statements, copies of brokerage statements, copies of their will, their trust, their power attorney, their health care. And in that questionnaire, I ask them, who would you like to have as your power of attorney? Who would you like to have in charge of your health care? Who would you like to have as the executor? Do you want to leave any money to charities? Who are the people in your family? And I even ask for telephone numbers because what I'm trying to do is to get you to focus. You know, over years of paying tuition to the School of Hard Knocks, I've had clients come in and I've said, who would you like to have as your executor? Hey, that's a great question. And guess what's going to happen? We're going to spend a lot of time and they're going to have to come back because they were not prepared. And sometimes I view that, okay, well, it's my fault. So that means I've got to get the questionnaire out there and I've got to prompt them to think about these things before they walk in my door. And what a lot of times people do is they take the, the post-its and they, they put it on the different parts of what I call my estate planning questionnaire because they'll say, I don't understand what this word means or I don't understand the choices on donating my organs to somebody or what's this word here, fiduciary. Uh, so... That's what we're trying to do in the first consultation is to have you come in and say, here's where my assets are, here's what my income is, here's my age, here's my spouse, here's my children, here's my situation, essentially. And then nothing's cookie cutter 
in any of our offices. We don't just pull a, a document off the shelf and say, everybody needs a trust or everybody needs that. We don't do that. So I frequently tell clients that I'm kind of like a tailor. And what I'm trying to do is to figure out, do you like pleats in your pants? Do you like cuffs? Uh, how long do you like the sleeves? But what I'm trying to do is tailor make your situation to a plan that fits you and not everybody that comes in off the street. And so that's why it's a lot of you know, questions and answers and going back and forth to figure out where is it, like Microsoft, that you want to go today. And then once we figure out, with your consent, what it is that you want to have, you know, are we doing a simple will? Because a simple will might suffice because you, know, you might have a lot of money in 401ks, which is just like a trust. Uh, or do you really need a trust? Where are you going? We quote you a flat fee. And Connecticut law requires that whenever you hire an attorney, you must have a signed fee agreement. So we have the signed fee agreement for the office consultation, and we tell people we credit that against the flat fee of the documents. Because I'm kind of like a mechanic. I don't know what you need or want until I have the meeting with you, and you tell me what's going on in your life and what your goal is in terms of, you know, I want to walk away with this kind of document, or I want to take care of my kids, or I have a spouse in the nursing home. And then we figure it out and we quote you a flat fee. Kathleen, why don't you talk about what you like? I, I, I also apologize for not being able to give you a firm answer because as every person comes in, it's so complicated. You don't know if they have a spouse. You, don't, you just don't have all the documents in front of you, so it's hard, it's hard to know. But, um, you know, he, Jay charges $400 an hour, my rate is to 50 an hour, but um, he has a ton of experience, and so it's, it's all different everywhere you go. Yeah, that raises a, another point. If you already have an estate plan, um, it's very important to review that with your attorney. And I, I say it's important to review it every three years uh, because people sometimes come in and they have a will that's 20 years old, and they've never looked at it. They just say, I've got a will. It's all taken care of. It's very important to, to meet with counsel, talk to them, and, and figure out what he or she can help you with. Because as, as Attorney Kearns and as Attorney Barry have stated, the, the law changes, um, your circumstance change, and there's, there's things that you should review. So like, like when you have an oil change, every three or four years you should, you should look at your estate documents with your lawyer and, and make sure that your, your house is in order. So, yes, sir? question about Medic Medicaid and long-term care policies. I understand that Connecticut has a program whereby if you have a policy that meets certain requirements, after you've used all those benefits, the state will pay an equal amount of benefits. Can you clarify exactly how that works? And also, in your remarks, you talked about uh, not paying money to the nursing home, and the nursing home can put a lien on the house. I thought it was the state that is having to pay the money and is having to pay more if you have impoverished yourself. So I understand. Why don't we take okay, one, one at a time? time. Yeah. All right. For everybody who's listening, uh, this gentleman's talking about a long-term care policy that's called a partnership policy. Back in 1988, uh, Connecticut with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Okay, so I'm going to have to talk fast. i got 30 minutes. But the point of the story is, is that Connecticut was the first state in the country to develop this unique partnership between the insurance industry and Medicaid in that if you purchased a policy equal to the value of your assets and then you went into the nursing home and you used up all of the benefits underneath that policy, you got to keep your assets and go straight on Medicaid. So the way it worked is if you went out and bought a $600,000 policy, so you're not buying XYZ per day, you're really insuring yourself for a pool of money. And you spent down that 600000 you get to keep the 600000 and go on Medicaid. If you bought a $300,000 policy and you had $600,000 worth of assets, well, when the $300,000 is gone, you then have to spend down 
$300,000, and you get to keep $300,000 out of your $600,000 of assets. Some states are different. When the partnership first came out, there was Connecticut. New York State had a different one. New York State just said, you insure yourself for three years, you go on Medicaid at the end of three years. Oregon had one. California had one. Indiana. Those were the first five in 1992. Subsequently, with the Deficit Reduction Act of 2007, George Bush said, we're now allowing all 50 states to have a partnership program. But before we get excited about there, that there is reciprocity between some states. I'm not sure where we are in Connecticut, but you know, for instance, if you went to Indiana, I know Indiana has reciprocity with Connecticut, so you could take the Connecticut Partnership Program, go to Indiana, go to an Indiana nursing home, and you'd be all set with the partnership program there. But between these different states, you have to evaluate, is, am I insuring myself for a pool of money or a period of time like the New York policy? To go back on my comments, the state of Connecticut puts a lien on your home. It's a lien to DAS, Department of Administrative Services. It's a Medicaid lien. And that lien stays on the house until the house is sold, and then you first pay back the state. Frequently, I'll tell my clients, let's get a lien on the house. <gasps> a lien on the house? Yeah, because the Medicaid rate is two-thirds what you and I pay, and they don't charge interest. And so then we have the Medicaid lien if we have to have a lien on the house, and that's what happens. The nursing home will only put a lien on if there's been a transfer, someone's disqualified, and now they're bringing a lawsuit to collect, much like a landlord is bringing a lawsuit against the tenant saying, you owe me rent, you didn't pay me. Because the problem with a nursing home is this, and that is, you know, if you're self-pay and you're paying every single month, the state doesn't care, the state's not involved. But once you apply for Medicaid, then the state determines with the look back, has there been any gifts made which is going to disqualify somebody for Medicaid? And if they're disqualified, then of course the nursing home is going to say, gee, it's taken six to eight months before the Medicaid application got processed and denied. We're out eight months worth of care, you know, eight times 15,000, you know, you're jumping up in a hurry. Uh, and then, of course, the nursing home is going to hire a collections attorney to bring an action. But it, it's unusual for the nursing home to get involved in the litigation unless there's transfers there. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Have a little help with the insurance part of this. Yes. My husband has an insurance policy. In the Medicaid application, I am very sensitive to the fact that a lot of times the DSS worker has 70 to 80 files on their desk, and I like to be one and done. And so when I prepare a Medicaid application, I want them to come back, and they always do because federal law says they have to process it in 45 days. Doesn't happen. So they'll come back and ask you for something you already sent in. So knowing that and knowing your scenario with the insurance policy, I would counsel you to just assign, and that's the term of art when it comes to transferring life insurance policies. It's called assignment of ownership. I would just have you assign the policy to the funeral home. And once it's assigned to them, they change the beneficiary from your husband to the funeral home. So this way you've prepaid your funeral using the life insurance. Why? Here's the biggest reason. Whenever you're looking at an insurance policy that has a cash surrender value and the face value of the insurance, if you went to cash it in, you'll find that you're going to get $1,000 less on cashing it in as opposed to the paid-up insurance somewhere in that neighborhood. That's might have been my experience on average. So you're, you're, you're throwing away $1,000. So instead of cashing it in, when the legislature changed the rules some two or three years ago, 
I would just simply meet with the friendly funeral director, sit down and say, I want to take my, my small life insurance policy and I want to use this to prepay my funeral instead of cashing it out. Yes, yes, to get, get full value. value. Okay. But, but when, when you, you take, take a look at how much the, the, the funerals cost, cost now. Yeah. Right. So down the other one, the larger insurance, life insurance, my husband took out because he wanted me to have money after he died. Right. So if you come to me, if I'm not in a nursing home, right. Right. it's just money that becomes part of your asset or, or income or whatever. Unfortunately, Unfortunately there's, there's no... no clear answer on what to do with that it's almost like rolling the dice at the casino you know if your husband's in the nursing home how long is he going to last uh, what's the cash surrender value should we borrow against it so as not to be disqualified you know sometimes people get confused about insurance and they might have a term insurance policy where they might have been an employee of the state of Connecticut, and therefore the state of Connecticut owns the policy, and they're the insured, which means, you know, they can't cash it in. You know, the nightmare for the state is, if your husband was sitting in the nursing home and he's got a large insurance policy, he's going to drive down to the Etna and say, here I am, uh, Cabby, wait out here, I'm going to go get the cash surrender value, and then we'll go down to Mohegan Sun and spend the money. It, you know, that's not really going to happen, but the fear is, is that if we exempt large amounts of life insurance policies that then have large amounts of cash surrender values, you're kind of defeating the system. So I'm sorry to disappoint you with not having a clear answer on that, but there's a lot of variables that go into thinking that through. And on your policy, which is the smaller one, it, it, it's a lot simpler just to go to a local funeral home and take care of that. Any other questions? Okay. Great. Oh, there is one. Excuse me. Oh, yes, sir. Oh, yes, sir. I'm sorry. Hi, Mr. Cassidy. You think a conservative is, has this spent funds? Can you ask the probate for an audit of the account? Good question. Yeah. So. Th he asked, if, uh, if somebody thinks the conservator has misspent funds, can you ask the probate court for a hearing? And absolutely, um, that's a, that is uh, the beauty, really, of having somebody who's managing your money be under the supervision of the probate court. Uh, you can uh, go in and ask for a hearing, <clears throat> and the court can demand an accounting and, and remove the conservator if necessary. So, yes. Just to, just to follow up on that, the conservator is required to file periodic accountings with the probate court, which are scrutinized, and if there's any misuse of funds, it, it, it may be picked up at that time. But that's a very good question. Any further questions? I have a question. Yes, sir. Conservator was uh, assigned by probate court, right? Conservator. Conservator. By probate court, by you. Yeah. The, 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 you, you apply for the. Yeah, if, uh, if, if we. My son, you say, oh, yeah, I have power authority, but I'm very busy, a lot of work, he applied to probate court and say, please, can you assign conservation? You will do that to keep it. But you will be assigned specific lawyer. The question, the question is, 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 does the court assign a conservator if you make an application for the appointment of a conservator? Yes. And, and the answer is yes. The court will assign it unless there's someone else that steps forward and asks yes, to, to be, be uh, appointed uh, as a conservator. Uh, it, it, it's option. It's option. The, the petitioner, petitioner can ask that, that someone, someone be, be appointed as conservator. If there's no one there, there or if that person is appropriate, appropriate, the court can assign. Can and, and the court, the court has, has to, to, to allow the the person who is being conserved an opportunity for the council, council to, to examine, examine that, that proposed, proposed conservator, conservator and to see if they're appropriate for uh, the job. Okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah, there are requirements. Yes. 
Well, with that, we'll, we'll conclude. I really appreciate your attendance. Thank you very much. Thanks.